Good evening, Western Avenue Baptist Church. Let me go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this week. We thank you for this opportunity to be able to gather here tonight to be able to hear the Word of God being taught, especially the topic of ecclesiology, the study of the church. Father, such an important topic for the body is indeed, it belongs to Christ. And we are the church and how we are called to organize ourselves, the gifts that we've been given, the way that edifies and builds up the church. All of that is of uh, very big, major importance to us. And so, Father, I pray that you would be with our brother Terry as he teaches this. Um, help us to have ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to understand this truth and to be able to apply it into our lives that we may continue to grow in the, in the image of your blessed Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we know that uh, this being the spring break week, we do pray for all the kids and parents and families out there that uh, you are in their presence, blessing them, helping them to enjoy this week, but also to keep their eyes fixed upon you, your will, your purpose, and the hope that we have in your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we give thanks and we lift these things up in his most blessed name, Christ Jesus. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> well, we began our study of ecclesiology last week, and we dealt with some preliminary concerns, and we started our introduction. We talked about the definition of the word church, the ecclesia. Uh, we talked about the uh, controversy as what the foundation of the church is. We're going to continue looking at that term, well, related term, but let's review what we talked about last week. Uh, the word ecclesia itself simply means called out or called out of, it, or it's an assembly, basically. And we looked at this chart, the way the word is used, the Greeks used it for a, an official meeting, a gathering, or just a mob. Anytime any people got together, for whatever reason, it was an ecclesia. They're taken out of the stream of life, and put, put in this group for a particular reason. <clears throat> it's used in reference to Israel as the ecclesia in the um, wilderness, back in the book of Numbers. Christianity uses it for both the universal church, that's all believers of all time, and all the local churches. And of course, the local churches are made up of people in the universal church. So there are different uses for the word ecclesia. That's basically what we discussed last week. We want to continue talking about this term and look at the uh, derivation of the word church. That's the word we're used to. We don't use the word ecclesia. We use the word church. Why do we use church? So how did we get from the assembly of called out ones to the church? Interesting derivation here. <clears throat> well, it starts in Greek, the word uh, kurios, which is often translated Lord. We use it most often in terms of Christ the Lord, the Son of God. But it also was used simply as a term of respect or authority. Um, sometimes it's, it, it's roughly equivalent to our word, sir. It's a term of respect. When Paul was, or Saul at the time, was headed up to Damascus to arrest Christians, uh, Jesus confronted him flashing light, blinds him, and he's knocked off his horse. And Jesus says to him, why are you persecuting me? And Saul, blind, can't see anything, says, who are you, Lord? Not that he recognized this was Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, but he's being respectful. Like, whoever this is had enough power to blind me and knock me off my horse. So I better give him some respect. 
So in essence, he was saying, who are you, sir? Uh, so it's used in that way as well. But for our purposes, mostly it's in reference to the Messiah, the Lord, Christ. That's the noun form. The adjective form, kuriakos, uh, means of the Lord. <coughs> These prepositional phrases, starting with of, are called genitives in Greek, and they can mean several things, and you determine the meaning based on the context, which is kind of a nice puzzle sometimes. But in this case, it's pretty clear, this is God's assembly. Jesus said, I will build my ecclesia. Okay. <clears throat> So in this, in this case, uh, the adjective kuriakos means of the Lord, meaning it comes from God. He's the one who started it. Could also mean it's characterized by God as well, which would also fit theologically. Well, from there, and I'm skipping a lot of steps here, uh, we go to Middle English, and the Middle English equivalent here is the word kirka, in Scottish, it's kirk, K-A-R-K, for church. So Middle English is kirk, a C-H. The C-H is sound like K's, which, if you look back at the kureokos, is parallel. We'll see that in a minute. And from Middle English to Modern English, we get the word church. To see those terms together, I kind of color-coded them here, if you can see that. Um... I have the K's in red, or the CH's in red, since they are parallel, and the vowel and the R in the middle in purple. So, kuriakas, we have the K's in red and the UR, the vowel and the R in purple. And go to the Middle English, kerka, the CH's are in red because they're like the K's in kuriakas. And you have the IR, the vowel and the R in the middle in purple. That's parallel to the UR in Kuriakas. And then the current word church, same thing. The CH is in red because you can see the line of derivation there. And the UR in the middle in purple because it kind of follows through all the other words. So we don't use the word ecclesia anymore. We get our word church from the word Lord because this is God's assembly. Okay, and That's basically what church means based on the derivation of the word. It's God's assembly. <clears throat> so all of these basically mean God's assembly. So we've looked at the definition, the context, Matthew 8 or 16, when he said, I'll build my church or really build my ecclesia. He didn't use the word church. The translators of the modern English versions usually translate ecclesia as church. Technically, it should be translated as assembly. Ecclesia is a transliteration of the Greek. Transliteration means you take the sounds of the word in, from the original language and put it into the parallel sounds in the target language. So, ecclesia is pretty much the way it sounds in Greek and in English both. <laughs> Just, but that's a transliteration. It's not a translation. The translation would be assembly. So, technically, if the if the uh, modern versions in the New Testament want to be accurate, instead of, trans, instead of using a transliteration, I'm sorry, instead of using a translation of church for ecclesia, they should translate it assembly. It would be more accurate, and I think less confusing, because people get the idea, well, for example, and we'll get into this in a minute in more detail, but when it says 
that Israel was the church in the wilderness, people are going to think, well, wait a minute. I thought the church started in Acts chapter 2. <laughs> and now you're calling Israel the church way back then? Well, most, I shouldn't say most, at least New American Standard translates that the congregation in the wilderness. But it's the word ecclesia, the, the assembly. <clears throat> As we will discuss in a minute, it's tricky to identify Israel as the church, the ecclesia in the Old Testament in the sense of church. But we'll get into that in a minute. And we talked about the term, well, we talked about the controversy of what is the, what is the uh, foundation of the church, is it the apostles? Is it Christ? Is it Peter's confession? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. When Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church, what is that rock? We talked about some options there. It could have been the apostles because the apostles are identified in Ephesians as foundational to the church. But when you get down to it, Jesus is the one foundation. The apostles gave foundational teaching to the church. Uh, but Jesus is the foundation, I want to say, of the structure of the church. Not in the physical structure, but putting the, the assembly together. Calling people out. And then we looked at the term, both ecclesia and church. So now we get into the identity of the church. And this will probably take up the rest of our time. Uh, if, if it doesn't, it's going to be pretty close. So we're going to end with this discussion because the next one gets into the nature of the church. And I don't want to start that and then have to stop and pick up in the middle next time. <clears throat> in a sense, the identity of the church is also part of the definition. If the definition is the ecclesia, the assembly, uh, God's assembly, that's kind of the identity as well as the definition. They're close. But identity also is something different. And I bring this up hesitantly. <laughs> this is not an issue you're probably going to have to deal with in any in-depth way, but you may come across it. So it's, it's good to be aware of it. Um, it is a controversial issue. We talked about this a while back when we did our series on apologetics. No, I'm sorry, uh, hermeneutics. Which is still available online, I think. Um, what constitutes the church? Not in the sense of the called out ones, but uh, how do you identify the church? And this deals specifically with the idea of Israel and the church. So we're dealing with two, two philosophies, if you want to call them that. We're dealing with covenant theology and dispensationalism. And this, is a, this can be really, really intricate, <laughs> in-depth, and you know, people fight over this. <laughs> I don't want to fight over this. <laughs> so this is, again, just so you're aware of this, okay? And, and those identities play a critical role also in how you end up interpreting Revelation. True, true. So basically, for definition purposes, covenant theology says that God works with people on the basis of three main covenants, and we'll get into those in more detail uh, in a few minutes. The next several slides are going to be sort of repetitious because we're talking about the same issues but from different points of view. And so, one of the uh, ramifications of covenant theology in reference to Israel and the church is they say Israel was the church in the Old Testament and became the New Testament church. Therefore, Israel as a nation is out of God's plan. He's through with Israel. Israel morphed into the New Testament church. And so, all of the promises that were given to national Israel in the Old Testament were given to the church in the Old Testament. So they will be fulfilled in the church in the New Testament.
it won't be fulfilled to national Israel. Again, we'll expand these things in a minute. Dispensationalism, on the other hand, says that God works with people differently in different time periods. Those time periods are called dispensations. <clears throat> and this, the dispensational view of Israel and the church is that Israel still has its own identity and is still in God's plan. Uh, Romans chapter 11 is probably the key passage dealing with this issue. I highlighted a couple of sections there, verses 1 to 5 and verses 25 to 26, because they sort of condense the issue. Uh, but the whole chapter, if you want to balance it, you read the whole chapter. <clears throat> so we want to flesh out those ideas. That was just kind of an introduction. So we have a handout there that uh, deals with this. And the handouts will be available again on the website eventually. And I had an idea the other day. Well, sometimes these handouts are available in the, the uh, foyer out there, one of the side tables. But if you're looking at this online and you're on a computer, you could do a screenshot of the chart. And then you could blow it up and make it as big as you wanted save it to your computer or whatever. <clears throat> so we start with some, oops, I thought I got rid of that. Skip that. Um, we start with some uh, introductory comments there. Again, this is gonna repeat some of what we've already said. <clears throat> It says dispensationalism and covenant theology are two ways of viewing God's interaction with mankind since creation. Actually, since before creation when it comes to covenant theology. Uh, dispensationalism says that God has administered his rule on earth in different ways during different uh, periods of time called dispensations. Covenant theology says that God deals with mankind on the basis of three main covenants or agreements. And we're going to get controversial here. An overview of scripture seems to show that these systems are not mutually exclusive. If you read through the Old Testament, you will see both. You'll see God making covenants with people. We have the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant, Noahic covenant, Davidic covenant, all the way up to the new covenant. So there are covenants. And you, call, you also see dispensations, time periods. God dealt with Adam and Eve, and the dispensation of innocence, it's called, because Adam and Eve were innocent. When they sinned, God dealt differently with people. Now it's on the basis of conscience. That's another dispensation. And then the law came in, so we have the dispensation of the law, all the way up you know, to the New Testament. Then you have the New Covenant. Okay, the um, dispensation of grace. Sometimes the covenants and dispensations <laughs> match or overlap. Um, but there are important differences. Okay? As it goes on to say there, the underlying ideologies and the way these systems are applied show them to be considerably different. On the surface, the Bible shows both. You have covenants, you have dispensations. But when you look into what they actually say, we have problems. And um, covenant theologians would disagree with this next statement. From an objective point of view, dispensationalism seems to be more consistent with the Bible than is covenant theology. Covenant theologians would say covenant theology is the theology of the Bible. You, you know, everybody's biased. <laughs> you know, everybody has their own has their own point of view. And biases, biases are fine as long as you don't think that your bias is the final answer. Okay. And a, a bias is simply an opinion. Opinions are not law. They're just opinions. <clears throat> but I find it difficult to find evidence for covenant theology in Scripture. And we'll get into that in a minute. Um, 
So the following chart then will summarize the uh, main tenets of these perspectives as they relate to significant issues. So we have this chart, and I highlighted the area that is really our concern, and that's Israel and the church. But we'll start at the top. Down the side, we have the different issues, and then we have the two columns for dispensationalism, covenant theology, to show how they differ in these areas. The first issue is the basis of God's economy, how he operates things on earth, how he administers his rule on earth. We said this already, uh, dispensationalism shows different administrations or ways of administering during different periods of time called dispensations. Whereas covenant theology says there are three main agreements or covenants that affect all mankind. The three main covenants to covenant theology, the first one they call the covenant of redemption. And they say this was a covenant that was devised before creation and before the fall. The members of the Trinity got together, as though they could ever be separate, and decided to redeem mankind, because God knew all along that man would fall. And so they decided way ahead of time to redeem mankind through Christ's sacrifice. So that's the first covenant, covenant of redemption. The second covenant is covenant of law or works, the covenant with Adam and Eve. You can eat from any of the trees you want except this one. If you eat of this tree, you're going to die. The law basically says if you sin, you die. This is even true in the Mosaic Covenant. That's why God made that or set up the sacrificial system so that they could have a substitute. When they sinned, they killed an innocent animal, and God said, okay, I'll take that animal as your death so you don't have to die. Of course, all of that pictures Christ's ultimate sacrifice on our behalf, the substitute. So we have the law of redemption. We have the law excuse me, the covenant of redemption and then the covenant of law or works. Works because Adam and Eve had to obey or else. And the third covenant, third main covenant is the covenant of grace, which is through Christ, which is the way of activating the uh, covenant of redemption. And covenant theology uses the various covenants we see in the Old Testament at, to flesh out these different covenants. Okay. Actually, the New Testament as well, since we get into the New Covenant. But that's the essence. God works with mankind on the basis of these covenants. Uh, and that's it. So there's a considerable difference in perspective there on how God deals with people between dispensationalism and covenant theology. The second issue is hermen their hermeneutic, how they interpret scripture. Dispensationalism relies on the grammatical historical approach which says that scripture means what it says when taken in its linguistic and historical context. You look at scripture objectively. Who said it? Who do they say it to? Why did they say it? Where did they say it? What words did they use? What, word, what did those words mean to the writer and the recipients? Put all that together and that gives you the meaning of the text. So it's an objective way of finding meaning. Covenant theology, on the other hand, uses the allegorical approach. Allegorical Excuse me, allegory is all about symbolism. So the text itself, when you read it, a verse in the Bible, it doesn't really mean what it says. There's a spiritual meaning behind it. So this, the surface text is just symbolic of the deeper text. And the spiritual significance of the text, the hidden meaning, uh, needs to be supplied by... And you fill in the blank. <laughs> because it's an allegory, it's symbolic, anybody can make it mean whatever they want. Now, covenant theology would probably say, well, we depend on the church's interpretation. 
go back to the early church fathers because they use the same technique. The early church fathers use an allegorical method of interpretation. So covenant theology would say, well, the early church fathers interpreted this passage to mean this, and so that's what we go with. But the early church fathers use an allegorical method. And if allegory means symbol, and you can make the symbol mean whatever you want, <laughs> then in a sense you want to say, who cares what the early church father said? I, mean, I don't want to... <laughs> that sounds too cut and dried. You know, I'm not saying they were all wrong about every issue. But if you go back and study the theology of the early church, you, you look at some of those things and say, really? <laughs> that doesn't sound kosher. I would, I would add to that um, the, the allegorical method of interpretation for a lot of people who follow covenant theology, it can be selective. Yeah. So they will follow a grammatical, historical, hermeneutic for the most part. But when it comes to, for instance, promises to Israel, they'll make that into an allegorical kind of reference. Um, so they, they don't believe that the promises made to Israel the way Israel would have understood it is correct, that it has to be reinterpreted in the light of the New Testament. So I've, I've got close friends who are followers of covenant theology, and I would say for the most part they do follow that grammatical historical, except when it comes to the covenants, which seem very clearly pointed at Israel, they'll say, no, that's pointed to those who are in Christ, which is the church. So they tend to be selective about the allegorical method, really using it <clears throat> in order to what I would say fit their, their framework. Yeah, yeah. Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, it's, it's sort of ironic, I guess, is the word. Um, because covenant theologians would accuse dispensationalists of reading dispensationalism into the text. But in essence... <clears throat> that's what the covenant theologians do. They have an idea already, a theology developed, and they make the text fit their theology. As I said, this is controversial. I remember in, when I was in seminary, it was where everybody is, you know, taking theology classes and stuff, but occasionally I would see little knots of students in the corner, you know, here and there, and they were talking about this issue, and some were dispensational, some were covenant theology, and they were really going at it. They were getting angry, you know, trying to defend their position. And I stood there looking at it and thought, what a waste of time. <laughs> You're not going to settle anything. <laughs> and in essence, you may not, for any practical purposes, be able to settle the issue once and for all. So why argue about it? Now, there, there are plenty of common ground in there. So we get to the, the third issue there. That's the ramifications, the outworking of these two uh, thoughts, thought processes. And I have highlighted on the screen there the one that concerns us, that's Israel and the church. Dispensationalism says that God's promises to national Israel will be fulfilled to national Israel and the church, or national Israel and the church are distinct in God's plan. And uh, again, Romans 11 uh, makes that pretty clear. Israel was temporarily set aside to bring the Gentiles in, but once the Gentiles are in, then God's going to restore Israel. I mean, it's unequivocal. <laughs> it just says that. But covenant theology says that Israel was, was or embodied the church in the Old Testament, so the New Testament church came out of Israel. All the Old Testament promises to Israel were to the church and will be fulfilled in the church. So Israel's out of the picture. <clears throat> uh, the rest of these, uh, the next issue on the chart there is eschatology, how this impacts our understanding of the end times. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because it's not really our focus, but just to, to complete the discussion. Um, 
first of all, the rapture. Dispensationalism says that the rapture removes the church from the judgment that comes in the tribulation. And covenant theology says the rapture is the second coming of Christ and occurs after the millennium when Christ raises both saints and sinners to judgment. Regarding the tribulation, dispensationalism says that the seven-year tribulation begins judgment on unbelievers and persecution on Israel and new believers for seven years. And uh, covenant theology says there is no seven-year period of tribulation. It's symbolic, again, of any time throughout church history that believers have suffered for their faith um, or wars and disasters have happened. So it's basically any time anything bad happened to the church, that's what the book of Revelation calls the tribulation. So they make it a, a very vague thing. Um, next for... The millennium, dispensationalism, says Christ will reign in righteousness for a thousand years and Israel will be the center of worship on earth. This is the Davidic kingdom that God promised. Just read through the book of Isaiah. Several chapters there talk about what this time period would be like when Christ rules in righteousness. Covenant theology says there is no literal thousand year reign of Christ. Uh, The thousand simply means a long time not a specific time period. And the millennium is symbolic of Christ's reign in the hearts of believers and the expansion of his universal kingdom, which occurs simultaneously with tribulation. As the church is growing, it's also undergoing difficult times. So they kind of happen together. So it's more, the tribulation and the millennium are more like themes than they are literal time periods. And finally, um, the last point there, under dispensationalism, the faithful remnant of Israel will receive the fulfillment of kingdom promises. Covenant theology says that since the church is the outgrowth of Israel, there is no faithful remnant in Israel to receive kingdom prophecies. They will be fulfilled in the church. So there are differences. (laughs) On the one hand... There are dispensations in Scripture. There are covenants in Scripture. But when you look at what those two philosophies say, they're completely different. So uh, let's wrap up tonight with kind of a summary of this, the identity of the church, from these two points of view. Covenant theology has history on its side. The church fathers, the early church fathers uh, held to this, and the reformers, believe it or not, held to covenant theology. Uh, But it seems to be scripturally weak. They're interpreting scripture based on the idea rather than developing the idea from scripture. Also, dispensationalism, though late in its development, it didn't come along until the 1700s, uh, it seems to be more in line with an objective approach to Scripture. Both systems have merit, and definitely proving that one is better than the other may be difficult and ultimately a side issue. You know, like, what difference does it really make in the long run? And finally, however, for the purpose of this study, Scripture is rather clear that Israel and the church, though related, are separate entities when it comes to God's program. National Israel remains intact. And I quoted there from, from Romans 11.29, which says the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. God chose Israel to be his special people. Out of all of the nations on earth, God says, I chose you. Well, that calling doesn't go away. When God gives a gift or gives a calling, it doesn't change. And God works through the New Testament church to advance his plan of redemption. We see that in what we already saw in Matthew 16, 18, when Jesus says, I'll build my uh, 
assembly and the gates of Hades will not uh, overcome it. It's going to succeed. It's going to progress. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says to the disciples, you will be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. That's the church expanding. And all of chapter 2 of Acts, where we have the Holy Spirit coming, which is the inauguration, basically, of the New Testament church. We have Peter's sermon, which convicts many of the multitude of Jews who were there from all over the world, the populated world of the day, for uh, both Passover and Pentecost. They are convicted. They repent, and it says they were added to the church, to the assembly. And I'm sure when they went back home to whatever country they lived in, they brought the the, the message with them, the same message. And the rest of the book of Acts is all about the expansion of the New Testament church, bringing the, the new covenant to all people. <clears throat> I just want to add, when it comes to dispensationalism, recognize there's a lot of different flavors of dispensationalism. So don't assume that just because you read something from an early dispensationalist that that's what all dispensationalists believe. So when you talked about how this kind of was developed in the 1700s, uh, John Nelson Darby, and we had uh, resources like the Schofield Bible, um, the Chain Reference Bible, um, things like that. Uh, There are ideas in there that are not shared by everyone who calls themselves a dispensationalist. Right. As I said, this is an overview, a simplification, just so you're aware of the issue and where it stands. But uh, yeah, there are always variations. You're mentioning the Schofield Bible. It has very, it was very influential. It reminds me of a little verse that somebody came up with because of the influence of the Schofield Bible. I mean, Schofield's notes were like absolute truth to the church for a long time. <laughs> and somebody came up with this little verse. It says, My hope is built on nothing less than Schofield's notes and scripture press. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's the, way, <laughs> that's the way it was for a long time. <clears throat> so that's kind of where we're going to end tonight. Next week we'll get into the nature of the church. And uh, you're going to think, well, the nature of the church and the identity of the church and the definition of the church are kind of all the same thing. Well, there are differences. So we shall see. So any comments, observations, questions about any of that? Well, excuse me. Uh, Schofield simply took this idea of dispensationalism and ran with it, and perhaps went to some extremes. And his interpretation of different passages of Scripture, we would look at that and say, "Well, I don't know about that," are off because of the way he he. expanded on dispensationalism. So he did a great scholarly work. I mean, phenomenal. I don't know how anyone can have enough time in their life <laughs> to do all the things that he did. But um, you have to be careful with it. I, I think, and I would have to double check this, um, I, I think he, he, was, um, he was influential in people reading the events of the end times through modern day events and felt that that was a legitimate way of interpreting revelation, that we ought to 
interpret Revelation through modern day events, which is always dangerous. Um, we have to interpret it according to how we believe the original audience would have received it. And that kind of view, when you interpret it through modern day events, and I'm not saying that Schofield intended this, but it has led to a lot of false predictions uh, about the end times. It has led to just a lot of damage to the testimony of the church when they do things like this. And so people that are very anti-dispensationalist will often point to that kind of practice as being very damaging to the reputation of the church. And they might point, point to people like Schofield as being influential in that. Um, but I agree with Terry, the amount of work that he put into that was amazing. And we just have to realize that anytime we look at any kind of commentary, study Bible, references from any one individual, you have to remember that you're reading the notes of someone who is still imperfect. You know, none of us have the entire market of orthodoxy cornered, right? So we, uh, we do our best to try to interpret. Uh, this is also, I think, a good reason why we want to interact with church fathers. We want to um, understand how they interpreted it and make sure that we kind of put to test what we interpret compared to what they interpret. It doesn't mean that they're, they're the gold standard, um, but it does mean that, hey, there's been a lot of believers throughout the years, and no one has ever gotten it all right. And I think it's just a good test to be able to compare what we're interpreting compared to other faithful fathers in the faith who, who have gone through these passages as well. Right. Good. Anything else? <clears throat> okay, if I can do this. You want to close in prayer? My voice is gone. Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening and this time. We just pray that you would just continue to help guide us by your spirit, help us be led by the wisdom of your word. And we pray that the church of your son, Jesus Christ, would continue to be edified and would continue to grow into the image of the of the head of the church, Jesus Christ himself. And Father, may you be glorified in all things, and we lift these things up in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen.